the most valuable piece of virtual real estate on the planet is black owned. How do you celebrate freedom? Well, join us on Friday, June 18th, 2021 for Juneteenth. If you only had an existence that was enslaved and you were wondering how do you properly use your freedom? When you have your freedom and know how to use it, it brings you power. Join some of the top speakers on the planet with the founder, Quentin Anderson, president and chief mental health strategist, Donna Jean, founding member and NFL Hall of Fame, Marshall Falk, international transformation strategist, none other than Dr. Lotus Roche, global ex-employee brand articulator, John Graham, networking ninja, which Tandra Price, insurance expert, Daryl Perry II, and the CEO of Black History and Cultural Academy, Lisa Leva, media creator and strategist, Martin Pratt, co-founders of Black Empowered Unified, Nene and Ikene Okolo, chief brand strategist, CBS speaker, entrepreneur, and TV personality, Ray Leonard Jr. Here's a sneak peek of some of our global influencers. The leadership development strategist, Sakoni Prince. The solution architect, Rachel Ray Johnson. Fabulous female football sensation and shoe company owner, Santia Jack. Join us on June 18th as we share the Juneteenth event. Join the movement because it's our time. Visit blackowned.com and also go to https colon forward slash forward slash blacktalentcommunity.com. We'll see you there. Peace, 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 everybody. It is a guy with a bow tie checking with you live for a special, special, special edition of Professionally Black for Juneteenth. Let's represent everybody here for blackowned.com. We've got Clint Anderson and Donna Dean in the house. Please, everybody in the audience, if you're hashtag team live, let us know where you're watching from. Thank you to you. Thank you. We're on Donna Dean's Facebook. We're on YouTube. We're on LinkedIn. We're taking over the internet because Juneteenth is tomorrow and we want to do something with it. I'm the guy at the boat. As I mentioned, I want to make sure I introduce my panel of amazing melanated guests. We will start off with the head honcho himself, Quentin Anderson, owner of blackown.com. Let us know your gift, King, and what we're here for. Yeah, thank you. Um, I purchased the domain blackown.com 20 years ago uh, in the month of June. And my idea was I wanted to surround myself with some of the, the smartest, most talented black people on the planet and for us to build our own Wakanda. Um, and so, you know, it's taken a while, but here we are today. It's our time. There's never been a better time to be black than today. So I'm looking forward to this discussion and how we can move the ball forward as it relates to what we're doing with Juneteenth. So thank you. Boom. Love it. All right. The, the right hand is Donna Dean. Oh, well, hello, everyone. How's everybody doing? I'm Donna We're Dean, good. and I am the, bear with me, I am the uh, president of BlackOwned.com, honored to be in this space with these uh, brilliant people, uh, and I help our community, our people thrive uh, through education, employment, uh, and also economics and entertainment. We are igniting a movement here at BlackOwned.com, and we are inviting each and every one of you to be part of the movement. Thank you, Donna. Appreciate that. Get you a solo spot up next. The networking ninja, Chandra Price, represent for us, Queen. <laughs> You're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> well, let, let me start over. What job? I just thought I'd throw that in and kind of get us some excitement. My name is Tandra Price. I'm known as the networking ninja. I help entrepreneurs implement their networking strategies to help them with their business grow and to cultivate relations. I am so excited about this conversation today. Listen, I couldn't even keep my seat hardly. So listen, I'm glad that you are all there and I see amazing people chiming in. Listen, it is our time. It is our time for the movement to make things happen. So 
Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Queen. Thank you for that. Right below it, you got Liz Liba sitting on and LinkedIn on fire with her posts all the time, hitting a million views recently. Let us know what you do, Liz. Oh, you're on mute still. <laughs> My name is Elizabeth Liba, and I should have noticed that since I've been on presentations all week talking about Juneteenth. I'm excited to have this conversation. I am a vabid, I guess, consumer of Black history. I started Black History and Culture Academy um, at the beginning of the year. I have about 400 students registered and subscribed to that platform. And that's my own micro learning platform with about 50 students. But I also, uh, 500 students total. I also have been uh, in 50 classes. I also have been a college educator for the past 10 years. Um, and I'm just a social justice warrior, an advocate for social justice. And I've been featured in New York Times, featured in CNN and Forbes magazine, and just been really speaking outspoken about black history and culture over the past year or so. That's it. Thank you for that, Queen. You're definitely being seen, so we appreciate that. Down below, Martin Pratt. Hey, what's up, family? Uh, hi, I'm Martin Pratt. Um, was able to create a brand called I Love Black Women back in the day on Twitter. I-L-U-V, Black Women, the first person on Twitter with the word Black in her Twitter name. And because of that, we were able to have conversations, uh, discussions where we argued on Twitter, as that's nothing new. But we argued about being post-racial. And there were about four of us that felt that we were going to be Black until we die. So we used hashtag Black and we're considered the grandparents to Black Twitter. Um, today, I'm really working with authors and brands to media brands and specifically to help them reach black people and to engage and make sure there's an impact. I appreciate being here and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Boom, love it. The OG, as he calls himself always. We have the two queens, young queens doing great things right there in Nene. Can you go off mute and introduce yourself and your sister? Hi, my name's Nene Okolo. And I'm Ekene Okolo. And we are the co-founders of the Instagram platform Black in PUSD. It stands for School District's name, Power Unified School District, that's in San Diego. And basically this platform was created to bring awareness to the racism that Black students and other students of color have experienced in the community. And through this page, we've been able to make a lot of new changes in, on, um, in our community as a whole. And yesterday was actually our one year uh, since we created the page. And in that one year, we were able to form a new racial equity and inclusion plan with the school district as well as um, implement ethnic studies and ethnic literature courses for students to take starting this fall, um, as well as anti-bias training. And they've also hired 12 um, new black teachers and a, another black uh, assistant principal. And since then, we've also been featured in uh, Parents Magazine and a few other um, news sources. So it's, it's been a great that we've had the opportunity to really bring awareness to this cause. And we're just so excited to be on this call today and talking with such great other individuals. Thank you for that. Appreciate it, Queen. Right below me, my, my YouTube thing, Ray Lunder, let us know what's going on. Okay. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, if my name wasn't a dead giveaway, I was part of the first black sports corporate family, so they tell me. Uh, my father was Sugar Ray Leonard. Um, but me personally, I've been I'm the president of Launch Team Consulting. Uh, we've been consulting for businesses all over the world. And I just recently joined Black Owned and uh, Black Talent Community to be the chief brand strategist for, for the organization. I'm a serial entrepreneur and I love fighting for our people. So I'm excited to have this conversation today. You had to put the fighting pun in there, didn't you? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I got it, man. Use what you, you got. You got to put it in there. There we go. All right, I'm gonna go to Queen Santia Deck, history maker. Let us know what's going on, Queen. Hey everyone, so my name is uh, Santia Deck. Um, I'm also known as Track Baby 001 all over social media. Um, I made history twice by becoming uh, the first female football player to sign a multi-million dollar uh, football contract. And then I made history a second time by becoming the first female athlete to own her own shoe company, which is Toronto's. Um, I'm also an influencer um, and I do a number of things. So I'm super excited to be here. Thank you, Queen, for bringing us your presence. And last, John Graham is on site in Hawaii. He's doing like a little uh, on site tour for us. Let us know what's going on, King. What's going on, DP, and everybody? I, I really have to go out and do more living uh, to match some of the accolades and the esteem uh, on this panel today. But I'm absolutely excited to be here. 
uh, John Graham, Vice President of Global Employer Brand Diversity and Culture for Shaker Recruitment Marketing, uh, author of uh, Plantation Theory, The Black Professional Struggle Between Freedom and Security, which launches tomorrow on Juneteenth, uh, general opposer, performative advocate of abolitionism and helping uh, clients and companies around the world become less plantation-like uh, by removing performative DEI structures. So it's a uh, pleasure to be with y'all today. Ooh, it broke up a second. I'll make sure people heard that part that the book comes out tomorrow. If you didn't hear that part, the book comes out tomorrow on Amazon Plantation Theory. I want to help them out because it's a phenomenal book. Yes. Um, Real, real quick, I want to make sure the audience knows we're seeing them because we got a lot of people in the audience. We have uh, Yvette Rochelle, representing from San Diego, jumping in here in the audience. Let me just put these comments up here real quick. We have Yvette. We have Paulana Thompson. She is an excellent web designer. If you need help with a web page, check out her company on LinkedIn, Paulana, Paulana Thompson. We have David. He's Team Lot. Thank you, Dave, for jumping in here. I don't know who this is because our security's too high, but they're in Chicago. Thank you for that. <laughs> We have Cheryl. She's in celebrating Juneteenth. Thank you for celebrating with us, Wayne. Ursuline, Team ATL in the house. We'll see how many ATL people get from here. We have Aaron representing in Pittsburgh. Thank you for PA. <laughs> PA in the house. Kiana, she's in NOLA. Thanks for representing from the southern region. We have also Arama. She's representing from New York. David Berkeley saying this is awesome. Thank you, David, for jumping in here. Ah, uh, Liz and I know Don. Don Seabury representing in, in Fort Lauderdale. Don is a fire starter. You got to check out Don's content. He's great. Uh, Steven, live from Pasadena. Okay, Pasadena in the house. Brandon Hawkins. Said, Good to see you, Q. Quentin, Quentin brought some people with him. <laughs> yes, Cinnamon in San Diego representing the West Coast. Um, we also had Cheryl said, joining from Queen City. Charlotte, I'm loving the synergy and connection of our people. Troy Halt from Florida, represent from Pensacola, Houston, Texas, with Jaria. I'm not going to butcher your last name. We got Jaria. Bay Area for Yolanda, the war, the workplace warrior. She's from Great Stuff too. Check her out for the Chinatown area. And Daniel, representing overseas. He's from Kenya. We got Kenya in the house. He's already Juneteenth here. He's celebrating early for us. So thank you, Daniel, for that. He has a great forum for Black empowerment as well. So check out Daniel's page if you need help learning more about the African influences of Black culture as well. Um, lastly, before we get into the conversation, the team live from David in Hartford, Connecticut. Good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to get some more comments here in the center. Coming in by the second, so I will keep up best I can. But the point of today is I've been gracious, uh, graciously blessed with Donna Dean's connection, introducing me to BlackOwned.com which I thought a white man owned a long time ago. I was surprised to hear that Quentin owned the, company, the website domain because it seemed like it was a BET flex where Viacom owns BET and it's not black owned and you think it's a black company and it's not. So <laughs> segue to that. Well, blackowned.com, I love that you're running the helm with this. So talk to the people real quick about what blackowned.com is and we'll get into the June team conversation shortly after. Oh, you're on mute. Originally, actually, uh, Asian guy owned blackowned.com, and uh, I was willing to pay whatever I needed to do to get it out of his hands. And so I was fortunate enough to be the one uh, that won the bid uh, during the auction time 20 years ago to get that name back in our hands. Um, so I wanted Black Owned to be focused on uh, four pillars. I wanted to focus on our youth and education, uh, our employment, um, economics, and also in entertainment. Uh, one of the challenges we face with our youth is that, you know, the way they're valued is their ability to entertain us, um, you know, whether they can run, jump, dance, or sing. And I want our kids to know that their value is a lot more than their ability to just be entertainers. I wanted them to understand, you know, their African history, their black history, and their African-American history, and the contributions that we've made to the United States and the world. And then on the employment side, you know, we have a CEO for Wells Fargo, essentially make an excuse of why they have no high level black executives in their company by basically saying we didn't exist. And at that moment, I saw every black executive in the world stand up and raise their hand and say, hey, we're here. You're just not looking for us. And then on the entertainment side, I wanted to put together a platform where um, our artists would get their power back, um, their, their followers are the real asset and so we've developed a plan for them to be able to maintain their power in the entertainment industry 
So we've got a lot of good things coming, and uh, I'll let Donna talk a little bit more about what Black Owned is about. But really what Black Owned is really about is grabbing the, the best talent, the best Black talent in the world, and us getting together and building something amazing together that we can all claim ownership of. I'll hand the mic back. Go for it, Donna. Well, just to, to piggyback on our great visionary, Quentin, uh, we are building our very own Wakanda, the most valuable piece of virtual real estate on the planet. We are building it for us. Although it's inclusive and all are welcome, it is designed to uh, build our community to help our people thrive in those four areas that Quinn mentioned, education, employment, economics. And when we do all this work, we're gonna to have to sit back and have a little fun. So that's where the entertainment piece comes in. We gotta have some fun in this whole thing. Uh, and we're just super excited. Uh, we are uh, starting a movement. It's not that others in the space aren't uh, moving and aren't purposeful in what they're called to do. Uh, we are just doing our part. I mean, let's face it, as we emerge out of the waters of COVID, uh, everything is at an unprecedented level, social unrest, mental health issues, uh, you know, uh, unemployment. We can go down the line uh, in terms of education, uh, our kids, uh, you know, being uh, steps back. Liz can certainly speak to that. Uh, you know, um, uh, going to virtual school. We, our kids are not at pace. And so uh, we are picking up the mantle. We have answered the call and we are doing what we feel we are called to do. And that's doing our part. It's going to take a village to transform this world. And we got to do it together. I think back at one of my favorite quotes by Dr. Martin Luther King, who said that we have got to do this together. We got to stand together as brothers and sisters, white, black, red, and every color in between. But we got to do this together in unity Otherwise, we are going to perish. And so we come with that lens that we're going to do this thing together. It is to build up our community. It is to build up our Black community. But we got to do this thing together. And so we're excited that we're launching BlackTalentCommunity.com. It is not a job board. It is a career and learning space, a transformative learning space. It's a place where uh, best-in-class uh, employers uh, who are looking for best in class talent who happen to be black people, black women, people of color, that they can come onto this platform and this community and we can join forces in unity to really make a difference in terms of the advancement uh, of our people. And that's just a little appetizer for now. <laughs> <laughs> a little appetizer, I like that. And I want to set the stage and obviously we have the recent news of uh, Juneteenth and federal holiday. So this is after we set this whole thing up that happened in the middle of this planning process. So now it's here and there's mixed feelings about it. Um, so today we want to make this a very action oriented conversation because we don't want to just kind of just party and celebrate and have nothing happen. So we want to kind of go around the horn to figure out now that we know what freedom is. I know John had a fascinating conversation bringing that breaking down general order number three. If you guys have not Googled that, look up general order number three and it breaks down what the statement was about Juneteenth and what it meant. And kind of set the stage for now and I'll probably have John dig into it, but I want to lead off with Santia because as an athlete, they're usually slaves to the business, slaves to the sport. They don't usually get to be free. So somebody that actually owns a shoe company, what does this holiday mean to you as far as exercising your freedom? Um, honestly, um, it really to me represents just freedom. Because for the most part, I feel like, um, you know, especially black women, you know, athletes, we don't really get what we deserve uh, when it comes to the sponsorship and endorsement, you know, deals. And most of the time it's just apparel deals. So for me to be able to create something um, that is a, uh, I guess, a kind of pulling away from that, you know, normal realm that we normally live in, um, I feel like it's not just something for me, it's just for the next generation of women and just our people, period, to know that, okay, that we do have a home, we do have a shoe company that is created by us, that is mainly bought by us, and, you know, we want to make sure that we're giving athletes in the future what exactly they deserve, male or female. So, um, for me, it's just about breaking barriers, it's just about breaking through glass ceilings, it's, a, you know, it's, it's really showing these kids that anything is literally possible, a young black woman stepping into a, a mainly male-dominated, white male-dominated world, and really leaving her mark. So um, I just wanted to create something that my kids that I will have one day will be able to be proud of. And, um, you know, 
it's all about legacy building and just making sure that that generational wealth is there for my future family and, and things like that. Awesome. And the, 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 the tie in the, the athlete, I mean, Ray, you're obviously in the, you mentioned the, the sports legacy family. Um, as someone that's basically come from that and kind of working on empowering our people now, we got an interesting dialogue for this started. So when you think about freedom and what it represents for our people and celebrating it now, what does that make you think of? Oh, so when I, when I think about freedom and about celebrating it for our people, I think about you know financial freedom. I think about educational freedom. I think about mental freedom. I think about things that we don't currently associate with freedom. It's like, here, you're in the bondage of this and someone lets you go. No, we have to take advantage and, and, and take control of where we are, how we move forward. You know, I was blessed to see that that process. I got to be around one of the greatest civil rights uh, advocates from Muhammad Ali in the sports business, you know, for for a long time and saw what he the, the mentorship that he gave to my father. He said, always sign your checks. And so instead of him signing with promoters, he got 30 people to invest in him and owned his own uh, rights and everything else as, as a fighter. And that changed my thought process about the world and about being black and how we can move forward and be free. Because if you don't own your own real estate and you don't own you know, your own identity, then you can never be free. So that is the, the benefit of what I've seen and why I'm looking back now and saying Juneteenth, all right, they, we said to here, we were let go. The Emancipation Proclamation came in. But there was a process and there was a thought, thought that, that, that was moving forward from that. And how do we move forward from that? And so uh, I love to have that discussion as we move forward. Ooh, I know who to start that off with. Definitely John Graham. Because <laughs> you think about that contract you mentioned that you signed as a corporate employee. So when you let's just pick with what Ray just said, where are you going to run with that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a great point, and I think it's it's super important uh, what Ray's talking about uh, and how we move forward. And you look at it, the historical context of what moving forward meant. Juneteenth was for Texas. Uh, a declaration of now your right to be employed as an employee to a employer, mm -hmm. uh, right? A, a reminder that idleness will not be tolerated. So it was a reinforcement of our commitment to this relationship between America and black folks and that being to, to work. And so as we think, think about, you know, how do we celebrate freedom? What is What are the next steps forward? And we think about, first and foremost, uh, the question I ask is, when were we taught to be free in the construct that we're in today, right? So you can't just release four and a half million black folks into freedom with no social safety net, no supports, no education, right? Um, uh, no, no means of sustaining uh, a living or shelters and things of that nature. So this inherent, there's, a, there's an inherent mechanism to, to, to move towards freedom, right? We naturally know these things. But make no mistake, we're still within the construct that does not align with our inherent call to freedom. And so as we fast forward to today, and we think about how do we exercise freedom, well, if you think about the wealth gap and the racial wealth gap, um, some, some suggest it's a racial wealth chasm, uh, which is far too great to be closed. Mm -hmm. So what can you do with that information? Now it's about what do you do to secure legacies? Uh, how are you setting up the next generations and seven generations beyond yourself to do better, uh, you know, generation over generation? And, uh, how are you informing and educating your families uh, on the unvarnished history, our history, not just uh, what's taught uh, in the K-12 education system, but giving uh, a comprehensive view of not only our contributions pre-transatlantic slave trade, but thereafter as well. Uh, in all facets of society. So, yeah, I mean, first and foremost, we need to first honor the commitment to rest, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 not associate our freedom with more work. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's, let's put that in context, right? We we need to first rest. There's so much. There's so many health impacts that Black folks are facing because we work far too much. Right, uh, the stress Ooh. that goes along with that, the blood pressure, heart, uh, and hypertension, right? All of these things, uh, I think first and foremost, rest, and then let's think about legacy. I'm gonna give you a chance to rest real quick and get some comments up. We have a Shanti, and that was fascinating. Everybody was Shanti on the panel representing New York Times. We actually had um, some other comments here that 
you know, Donna Dean's boo thing, her husband saying the launch of black So thanks for jumping in there, King. Um, I wanted to segue though real quick. When you mentioned the rest and the youth, we have these two Queens here that are the youngest on screen. I think <laughs> I'm pretty sure the youngest on screen. Um, it's great to see youth being involved in this. Cause when I was y'all's age, I didn't know what Juneteenth was. So as you two are here, what does this mean to you being so young and being embraced by this movement and understanding what's going on? Don't come off mute. <laughs> For me personally, I'm 20 years old and seeing how um, people are becoming more aware of Juneteenth as a holiday is honestly um, eye-opening and heartwarming. And I think that it signals that this country is moving towards um, in, in a better direction. And the recognition of Juneteenth as a holiday is not like the final step in uh, fixing racial equity, but I think it's a good first step in at least allowing people to be aware of what has happened in this nation's history. And um, it's definitely mm -hmm. something that, it's definitely something that um, we can hope that it allows people to really take the time to become educated about Juneteenth and Black history as a whole. Yeah, and I definitely agree. Um, I just recently thought about Juneteenth about a year and a half ago, and I didn't even, as a 17 year old, I feel like I should know about my history and know uh, something as significant as Juneteenth. And a lot of my peers didn't know as well. So. I feel like this just signifies that we need to um, improve our education system so that these types of um, holidays are taught. And um, like Nene said, we're moving in a better direction, but I feel like improving our curriculum and improving the education that students are receiving so they know about this is a huge step. We can't talk about education without getting to in the conversation. Cause I mean, this is something that it's not almost like not t it's just hidden. That's what I feel like it is. This June 10th is like basically to me an acknowledgement of the end of something. It didn't make it illegal because somebody mentioned on the comment before, well, we should celebrate the 13th Amendment, not Juneteenth. And that just made it illegal. Juneteenth just said, hey, we're stopping it. The 13th made it illegal. So Liz, when you think about the historical context, how important is you as an educator? What does it mean to you to kind of see this happening now and what to do with it and move forward? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there because when you think about the historical context, Emancipation Proclamation, was September 1862, was supposed to take place or be enforced January of 1863. That was really just performative because it was only the Confederate States. Then you have George uh, Granger marching into Galveston, Texas and proclaiming from the steps of the courthouse, hey, go back to your plantation and work for your owner, as, as John said. A little bit of a weird dichotomy there, a little bit of, of a, a, we've been working, we've been enslaved, legally raped, killed, murdered, uh, bred as chattel, and now go back to this person and ask this person for wages. A little bit of a not necessarily realistic. That's like I tell it, go to DCF, go into your house and say, hey, uh, you know, you're in an abusive situation here and your your parents have been abusing you, go back and tell them to stop doing it. That's <laughs> why we had the rise of Jim Crow. We had the rise of the KKK. We've had, as John mentioned, an insurmountable wealth gap because what did they say? Go back and go quietly. That, that verb is really, when I read that, I was like, go quietly back to the people that owned you, raped you, killed you, murdered you, could do anything to you. Go back quietly and no vagrancy. We won't tolerate you coming around to the military outpost and, and being around town. Well, where are you going to go? Because you didn't have a job. You were literally enslaved for 150 years. So for me, I like the young queen said, I agree that there's definitely celebration. It, we have to honor the ancestors. Because somebody, I think, when I posted about this, we have to honor the ancestors, everything they overcame, everything that they were able to overcome and, and go through and triumph over. Yes, we, we honor that we were able to come through Juneteenth. And as uh, John said as well, the 13th Amendment, and I think you as well, Daryl, the, the 13th Amendment really is what it, it outlawed slavery. And that wasn't until another uh, couple years after that. So we're talking about, you know, the, the, the 13th Amendment at December 1865. So we have a whole storied history of justice delayed, right? Us freedom denied and delayed, and we really haven't been able to really maximize and get to our full potential. So I think there's a lot to be said about this idea of celebrate. Two things, can, two, two emotions can coexist. 
Just like when right. George Floyd was murdered, we were distraught that he was murdered, but elated for the fact that, you know what, we're going to start speaking up now. We're going to finally let people know exactly what's been on our mind this whole time. So I think we're able to celebrate Juneteenth and understand that it's a holiday that recognizes the answers to everything that they went through and their ability to actually get pro proclaim that they were free, but also know that we have a long way to go and we have to keep pushing the envelope to get there. Yeah, Deacon, I, I like that. Add, yeah, add, go for it. And, and, and Liz, my birthday twin is always on point. I also want to say, you know, even if we think about the 13th Amendment, which comes with a grain of salt, didn't necessarily outlaw slavery because there's a clause in there that suggests slavery is sanctioned if you are a convicted criminal. Yep. Which then you see the birth of the industrial prison pipeline. So, uh, prison industrial complex, I should say. So at this point, I don't think we, we can celebrate it. We should celebrate when reparations happen. That's, that's the celebration, truly. <laughs> right? we, we, can, we can celebrate these small victories, as it were, in progress and incremental uh, evolutionary steps. But I just want to keep it, keep it all the way to 1,000. We still haven't seen a full uninterrupted uh, and unencumbered legislative act that has benefited Black folks fully. Yeah, and, as the, and John, as what? the young queen said, we have to educate the young folk, as they said, the, 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 all the textbooks come out of Texas. McGraw Hill, some of the biggest textbooks, publishers that are whitewashing history and not giving the young folk, these, these young queens and the other people, the youngsters that are in the classroom, they don't know about Juneteenth. They don't know about the truth. I talked American history and that history book, I looked at it with my own eyes. And people say, well, how do you know? Because I taught eighth grade American history. And it says civil war was fought for states' rights. It talks about slaves being happy on the plantation and benevolent slave owners. I'm tell not telling you something I read, I'm telling you something I saw. And that was the curriculum that we gave the students. So we have to really start teaching American history the right way as well and acknowledging the real history of this country for sure. That leads me to an interesting point with that. I mean, Santi, you mentioned you're you're not third. I think you said you just turned thirty. You're about to turn thirty. As someone, you know, you're, you're I guess that's Gen Z. I think I'm horrible with that stuff. But <laughs> for your generation, was that poured into you? Was your history poured into you, or did you not get it till later on in life that you actually started to embrace your history? Oh, you're on mute, Santi. My bad. Um, yeah, we really weren't taught a lot about our history um, growing up at all. Um, it's definitely something that I had to learn along the way, which is obviously very sad. Um, so, you know, honestly, just being a part of things like this is just like, it's almost mind blowing because it's, it's so many things that we just don't know. Um, and, you know, Juneteenth now being really recognized as a federal holiday um, back then, <laughs> we would have never talked about this, you know, even being a thing. Um, but we're taught mm -hmm. so many other things. So to me, it's just, again, it just kind of, again, it highlights, you know, where we are in America and in, in its history. Um, and I am excited and happy to see that things are slowly progressing, but we still have a very, very long way to go. Um, but, you know, and I still feel like the youth needs to be poured into more when it comes to our history. I do feel like um, definitely like this, the new generation, like they're very much into, um, you know, black power and things like that. So I feel like they're more curious and they're not just mm -hmm. taking things as okay. That this this is what it is, and that's it. No, I feel like the the new generation, this this generation coming up, they're asking questions, and that's something that you know, me being a millennial, we didn't really do. It's just like, oh, okay, you know, this is this. Okay, that's cool, and we just kind of went with it. Now it's kind of like, no, 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 no. This doesn't make any sense. Explain this to me <laughs> so that I know why we're doing this and why we're doing that. And I love that. I love that. You know, it, it's more rebels when it comes to you know our history and just learning about ourselves and what we deserve and things like that. Um, because like I said, when I was young, it was just like, hey, we're reading this in a textbook. The teacher said that this makes sense. So I guess it makes sense. And then that was it. So, um, yeah, like the, seeing the difference is actually pretty, pretty amazing. But um, but yeah, we really didn't learn much about ourselves. We learned more about Native Americans, mm -hmm. more about, you know, white folks and things like that. But when it came to ourselves, it's just like we were slaves. That was that. Move on. <laughs> right. So, that's that's what I that feel like it was like for me. <laughs> so that's all we really we were taught, <laughs> and, and it was it wasn't a good thing, you know. But it happened, and we just got to get over it, pretty much. That's kind of how we were taught when I was young. So, yeah. 
It's sad to see that hasn't changed. I'm I'm a barely millennial. My wife hates when I say that, but according to Wikipedia, I'm barely a millennial by the skin of my teeth. So it, it's it's sad to see that hasn't changed. But I know Ray, you was chiming in for a second. What do you have to add to that? Well, I'm not a millennial. I am <laughs> four, past forty something years old in the early seventies, baby. So, uh, but the, one of the one of the things that that um, that Liz brought up, it seems like we always have to restart. You know, uh, from from Black Wall Street to the Reconstruction era, when we tried to build, re reunite our families, to establish schools, post offices, to try to be radical in how we want to build our financial literacy to our people, and then all of a sudden it seems like we were always pushed to push to the back again. So when I when I look at, at, at Juneteenth and like you talked about, it's a celebration of a Thirteenth Amendment, and then Avery Duvernay put it out there and, and showed that you know, the institutional racism and, and the prison system was, was just a continuation of it is the excitement of being with, with blackowned.com is saying here we have to make a change and we have to do it ourselves you can't start taking care of somebody else until you take care of yourself first and foremost and so i look at it as an opportunity to, to build and move forward from from that space and uh you know i'm just i, I think I, I i told my daughter my kids i just started talking about we really started talking about Juneteenth last year or and, and we instead of we going into Doing the whole uh, fireworks with the Fourth of July first, we took a boat and was out on the boat on a, on a, uh, in San Diego talking about Juneteenth and what it was about. And so my daughter asked me this year, so so what are we gonna do this year? What are we gonna do? And so I think that's the start of the conversation and where we have to go and figure out. Okay, here this happened. They gave us a, a holiday, but what are we gonna do from that? Yep, this is a perfect part for Martin. I know he and I talked about it a little bit about. This shouldn't just be a new mattress holiday, a new discount holiday. Something should happen. So, Martin, what do you think about actually doing something with this holiday? Well, I think what everybody uh, brought out can help us to see um, that education is important. In the lens of what John Graham said, we need to read the actual um, amendments, the orders, we need to read. There's a slave letter that you can just Google. A slave owner had the nerve to write a slave that got out of slavery and lives in Ohio, a request for him to come back. So the slave wrote a letter to his slave, former slave owner and said the very thing. You didn't pay me, so my family is concerned for their safety, but myself, sir, I'm concerned for the wages that weren't paid. So if you like us to consider, not that he's coming back, like us to consider your offer, please pay me the wages of 11,800 and some dollars. So if you Google this letter, this is not the Willie Lynch crap, this is actual letter <laughs> that's on the front of newspapers across America in small towns. Not something that you see in Chicago, Detroit, uh, Harlem. So Google this letter, read how this brother talked about protecting his daughters, talked about protecting his wife, talked about making sure he gets a fair living wage in whatever 1867 this was. Then as John brought out, one of the things that I love about our community is a doctor came into clubhouse and said on stage that black blood pressure goes up when we sleep. There's a study yep. that shows our blood pressure increases. And until I had heard John talk about the order that stated, you are not to be listless or restful you are to constantly be in motion. Mm -hmm. Think about the DNA that, that has passed down. So what we have to do is frame our history, understand what frame we're in. And lastly, you can frame it very simply. That I hope that everyone would do this Juneteenth. Watch, exterminate all the brutes. Watch, enslave, exterminate our brutes is on HBO Max. Watch, enslave which tells you the financial piece of slavery that's on Amazon Prime with Sam Jackson. And lastly, on YouTube, there is a documentary called Century of Self. If you watch these three things, that's really simple. And I'm gonna promote this 
for Kwanzaa during the time of Kwanzaa also. As a collective, we need the framework so we understand exactly what box we've been put in so now we can break out that box and we can successfully move ourselves to a place where I'm taking a nap, y'all. Oh, my brother, peace, <laughs> love, what's up? Not, you taking a nap, you lazy. No, I'm taking a nap because I'm black. I'm taking a nap because I deserve it. I'm taking a nap because I deserve the grace and space as a black man to rest. Ooh. Man, if this were Clubhouse, I'd be flashing my mic right now. <laughs> <laughs> but you brought up a good point about that. But the beautiful thing about now is that all this history, you know, uh, I'm probably closer to Quentin's age than I am, six hand tea, is, is we had to gotta look up the library. We had to go to the library and get stuff and get a book. And I wasn't cool. That wasn't cool back in like you went to the library, you're gonna go get a book about slavery. Uh uh. But now you can literally tap this thing right here and go on the HBO Max and learn. And the interesting thing about uh, Exterminate All the Brutes is a Swedish man wrote the book. So it wasn't written by a black man just to kind of push the narrative. A Swedish man wrote this book. So when you think about that history, um, these two young queens, Nene and Kane, when you think about the history, how many of your youth are actually taking this holiday that you think to learn history versus going party? Unfortunately, I think a lot of people are just not informed enough about the history of Juneteenth, so they're not taking the initiative to actually learn about the holiday. Although on the flip side, I have seen a lot of my friends and people that I associate with actually taking the time to learn about that history, which is great. So I think the hardest thing is just spreading awareness and making people um, realize the importance of actually learning this history so that it doesn't turn into another like a uh, party weekend or a random holiday that people don't actually think about the meaning and significance of. Yeah, in the clubhouse room, we had a gentleman mention there's a Little Dirt concert being done for Juneteenth, which his music is about murdering black people. So they're like, is that really the place to do that? So one thing I make sure we do here is that everybody on screen, I'm gonna put Quentin up here to talk about black owned again, make sure in the comments, let us know a black business you know, put in the comments, your favorite black business, a black professional, you're trying to put some light on. We have a lot of people watching, a lot of people attending the event and register. So please, in the comments, let us know your favorite black owned business or black professional to get some light to. But Quentin, when you think about this holiday, um, action something you and I've talked about quite a bit about this. So what's an action you want to see the people do with Juneteenth? Yeah, you know, I think there are going to be a lot of people that look at this as an oppor opportunity to be a money grab. You know, you're going to see car sales, furniture sales, mattress sales. And what I would say is, you know, if you're compelled to spend money on that day to really be um, focused and in intentional about where you're spending your money, that we need that money to recycle back into black businesses. And then on the other side of that, you may not be a consumer on, um, on Juneteenth, but there's other ways that uh, you can pour in to the black community and help us build. So, you know, we all know some entrepreneur who is just needs that little boost to get to the next level. So let's grab 10 of our friends and pour into that entrepreneur to get them to the next level. You know, we all have somebody that we know that is struggling with a mortgage or rent or car note or student loan. And, you know, we can grab 10 of our friends and pour into those people, you know, keep uh, Ms. Jenkins from losing her home. So, you know, I think we can take Juneteenth and create the narrative that, you know, this is our opportunity to be my brother's keeper, my sister's keeper, that we look out for each other. And Juneteenth being that day that, you know, we have a hyper focus on making sure that we're okay. Um, there's, there's a lady that I met on LinkedIn, uh, and I love her name, is a Future King. And before you can even get to the small talk when you talk with her, she checks in, she wants to know how you're really doing before you can get to the small talk. And um, I think using Juneteenth as that way for us to really check in with each other, that we can control the narrative around Juneteenth. So it's not just about us having chicken wings and, and dancing on this day, that we can really make Juneteenth something special. Uh, we can honor um, our ancestors, you know, and the, fought, the fight and the struggle that they went through um, because I know personally me, I would have never been able to endure what they did, 
um, because uh, for two reasons. One, uh, I don't like people to tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I ask too many questions. So, um, you know, when somebody's trying to tell you what to do, the last thing they want to hear is some questions. So, you know, I would have never been able to endure what they did. So I'm appreciative of that. And I want to honor that and recognize that and be intentional on Juneteenth. So when we're at the barbecue, let's find out about what our brothers and sisters are doing. You know, if they're entrepreneurs there, let's figure out a way that we can build together um, so that we're not just having a party. I mean, this this will change the narrative. And they'll wish they never gave us this holiday after that. <laughs> There we go. And I, I appreciate you saying the gun to my wife has pushed me a lot. Go ahead, John. There, yeah, if I can j chime in on that, Clint, I love that. So so one thing that, that came to mind as you were saying these things is I want people to put into perspective as, as the headlines read that Juneteenth is a federal holiday, I want you to ask yourself one question. How much did it cost the federal government to make Juneteenth a federal holiday? Donuts, <laughs> right? Zero dollars. Um, just like it cost them zero dollars to integrate society, right? Cost them nothing. And, and, and Dr. Martin Luther King talked about that uh, in, in one of his uh, final speeches, uh, The Other America. So as we think about that, and, and to Quinn's point, so that this doesn't become a commoditized holiday, we should spend time, not necessarily going out and spending, but spending time, spending time in reflection and, and figuring out how we are going to agree to obligate ourselves to ourselves. Uh, before we can advance an economic agenda, we first have to agree to trust each other, right? And if you think about one of the biggest hits to the black community, which was the erosion of self-sufficiency through integration, we lost a black commitment and obligation to our communities and to ourselves first. Mm -hmm. And until we trust each other enough, right, if, until we have a, a common code, a value system, uh, a means of how we're going to greet each other, how we're going to speak and, and, and talk to each other, honor each other, correct each other, hold each other accountable, then we can't advance an economic agenda because we're just applying principles from another community into ours, and that doesn't necessarily uh, align. So I really this is perfect. Uh, this is perfect with this comment right here. Build the black economic base. We're that here natural. Go ahead, Ray. <laughs> no, I I just wanted to, to chime in on what John, what John said. Is is when you're talking about the the economic uh, you know, stability and every major city you see a, a Korea town, a, a Chinatown, you see a, a, a little Italy. Which if can you imagine if you saw a black town, <laughs> a black community, <laughs> like. It was. I I, I see uh, Black Wall Street all over again. You know, I see that happening again. So uh, we we have to figure out how to how to not just do that, but protect ourselves as well. And look, future king, future king is brought up. I'm gonna have to bring future up here because future gets brought up every time I go live. So thank you. We got some flowers for future. Um, Tandra, I know you have something to say, and then I get the Donna. Go ahead, Tandra. Um, I, you know what, I just, I just agree with everything that everyone is saying, all the comments that are being put in there. You know, for me, I'm, I, I, you know, to me, I feel like this is just unlimited opportunities for us to create other opportunities to help each one promote one and to leave that legacy. Um, I think you are all saying some amazing things. You know, it's time for us to, for us, for me to be more collaborators and get away from all this competition things as, as that, that the, that's out there right now, you know, that's helping us to get from West growing and to continue to make that legacy. So, you know, I think all you just right spot on. And I just, you know what, that is what we're here to do. And I'm so glad that we are realizing it's our time to do that now. I mean, thank you, Quinn, for putting this platform together and allowing us to be in a space where we can, you know, bring everyone together and understand the importance of what we're doing. So, well, yeah. I, I, I don't want to take credit for putting the panel together. Uh, I'll give that to uh, <laughs> Brother Daryl. <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll appreciate that. It's not me. It's the bow tie. It's not me. It's the bow tie. My mom's brooch. It's not me at all. It's something that makes work with those two things together. But um, Donna, uh, one, one thing real quick. Everybody watching the comments. If you don't know a black business to get a hold of right now, you're sleeping or not really watching the screen. Like if you're listening to this, fine. But if you can see the comments coming through, there's probably been at least forty black businesses tagged in the comments. 
So yeah. check out their website. At least give their webpage a view. At least give them that. <laughs> Try to work with a black business. Well, go ahead, Donna. You know, all great comments from uh, some of the most brilliant people I've ever had the opportunity to share the virtual space with. And, um, you know, I just want to piggyback and say it's, it's definitely time. It's our time. It's definitely time for us to come out of our silos. You know, and I, I uh, just offer up my transparent lens. You know, we spend our whole lives trying to climb the ladder uh, to be successful, uh, to make money, to have the best homes, to live in the best neighborhoods so we can raise our kids and give them the best life. Just by a show of hands, how many of you out there can relate? And I think that that climb up the mountain has placed us even within our black community in these silos because we've been just so focused and busy on climbing and shining the light on ourselves and trying to rise ourselves. And I really believe that we're in a transformative season, not that we haven't been before. We were in a transformative season during civil rights. It's all cyclical, but I think we're at an unprecedented new level of, of transformative uh, time where we've got to come together. We've got to unify all these brilliant minds that you're listening to, that we have to come out of our silos. We are better stronger, more brilliant together. And I also want to speak to our non-Black folks that are listening, because we're here to not just transform our Black community. We need you to know that we're here to be the light on the hill for such a time as this, because we're all called to help us to get out of, and I said it earlier on an interview, out of this perpetual season of trauma. The whole nation's in a perpetual season of drama. And it's going to take all of us coming together to rise above it as a nation, to heal this nation, one person, one soul at a time. And it's going to mean us going together. So I want to thank those of you out there, because some of us are married to non-Black. Some of us have relatives that are non-Black. Some of us have friends that are non-Black. Some of us work with colleagues who are non-Black. So this is about building up this Black community. And I'm at the forefront of it. I'm going to do everything that I can because I believe that this is no longer about me. It's not about my life. This is about me helping others up the mountain and helping my Black children uh, acknowledge that they are empowered to be all that they're called to be. So I want to speak to all of you out there that this is about us coming together. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, we got to come together, Black, white, red, and every other color. We got to do it together <laughs> or we're going to perish as a nation. I just got to give a mic drop, Donna. <laughs> that is a mic yes, drop. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> take a bow, Donna. Take a bow. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I, so, so, something you said really resonated. I mean, a lot. Everything you said resonated. But one thing in particular, you spoke to this, this competition, right? This these silos, this individual and I centric approach uh, that I believe is counter to our inherent nature. Uh, because that comes from a scarcity mindset, right? That comes from insecurity. That comes from this fear, uh, where historically we've been an abundant culture, right? We, we recognize that we had resources and everything we needed from uh, the land and from the earth and nature. Uh, and we didn't impede on our neighbors because they had the same resources we did. Even if you look at history and, and, and African cultures that had differing views of war, tribal wars, they didn't offset the, their their neighboring tribes to take their land and resources. They just didn't like each other, right? And that's okay. <laughs> you don't have to like each other. But this this notion of scarcity, which look after two hundred and forty six years of chattel slavery, the insecurity of those who enslaved us became our insecurity as well. And so we have to first really acknowledge our own insecurities and what is inherently us versus what has been imprinted on us, and learn to separate and shed that which was imprinted and really re recommit to this abundant uh, mindset that we have enough for all rather than it's a zero-sum game that I win, you lose, right? Uh, there's only enough room at the top for one. Like these are concepts that are diametrically opposed to our ethos. Uh, so I really wanted to add on to that, Donna. That's a brilliant statement. I just really quick, oh, pardon me. First of all, I just need you to know that I've adopted you as my big brother, John. So, you know, uh, uh, you're my big brother and uh, that's all there is to it. Uh, but, I, you know, I had a, a colleague, a, a white colleague that I worked with 
who reached out to me and in and, and so many words said, Donna, I'm, I'm happy for you that you've taken on this new role as president of this company called BlackOwned.com, but quote unquote, why so racist? Ooh. Oh, this, 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 Go ahead, Ray. Ray's ready. Look, so, he's ready. So, so, so <laughs> I'm not going to give you the whole thing. So here's what, you know, it, it just struck me. It was like lightning, kind of, I'm proud of you. Thank you. However, and I will tell you all kinds of emotions read through my bloodline. <laughs> and I made a decision. I said, let me take a deep breath. And this person says, I love you, but. So I made a decision, either I'm going to be a bridge for that other person to hopefully gain some understanding. Because see, I'm, I'm, I'm full of purpose to change the nation, and that means changing the mindset, to your point, John. But all of a sudden, I reached out, and I initiated some conversation. And, and that conversation led to some understanding, because this person had could not relate to anything we're talking about. Couldn't relate, what black on, why are you all feel you gotta do, have black this, black that, I don't understand, I don't get it, I can't relate. So I wanna say this, and I'd love to hear from this brilliant panel. I think that our conversations must be inclusive. We must include the nation in these conversations because there is no relatability, there is no understanding, there is no I'm compelled to support or get you. And we gotta work with each other. So I'm just- Ray, go ahead. You just open up, the, lift the fire. Go ahead, Ray. <laughs> yeah, you, you open up the fire to plug in. I, I've had the same conversation with some of my friends from different races and backgrounds. And so, Quentin, you, you, you will definitely uh, get this, uh, this metaphor. Because I talk about if we are a human race, and you know we're trying to you know, pass the baton to each other to keep moving until we all win together. How can we start 400 years behind and have a, a similarity of being fair if we can't even like try to catch up ourselves? So that's the first thing I think about is when we're talking about a, a, a race and all, us all being connected from a human race, we can't start way behind and not be able to pull ourselves up and get at least close to be a fair race to move forward. So that I just wanted to add that because Donna, you, you 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 dropped the mic on that one, so uh, <laughs> I wanted to just put that out there. <laughs> and real quick, I want to introduce Dr. Lotus joining us now. Hey, Dr. Lotus, how you doing, Queen? Hello, everybody. So happy to be here. God bless everyone and happy Juneteenth. You get to come in on the heavy part of the conversation now. <laughs> you know, I always come in on the mic drops and, and you know, my mic, I don't want to drop my mic because I need my mic for the show. But Donna <laughs> Dean, goodness gracious, and then, you know, Mr. Junior right there just came in and just put more, more flame to the fire. But you're 100 percent right. We have got to come together. There's got to be collective cohesion globally for all people of color. So I love that. So thank you for putting me in the hot seat as soon as I came in the door. <laughs> we we'll do it. That's how we do it. Yes. I'm, cu yes. I'm curious, and I'm probably going to be the contrarian. You know, having wore <laughs> I Love Black Women t-shirts in white spaces for 10 years mm -hmm. and seeing yeah. the uncomfortability and the white males saying, I love black women too, but the white women <laughs> saying, except for in DC, in DC on the Metro, all white people hate <laughs> my t-shirt. I don't know why, but I'm gonna say this, that I don't know that, um, and I said this to Dr. Joy um, when she first came to New York, I get her, she had an organization about inclusiveness. She wanted to say, once we once we understood post-traumatic slave syndrome, let's jump ahead and let's include. I, I feel like we got at least 10 to maybe 20 some years of work internally. Right. So while it's mm -hmm. not my it's not my desire to exclude, it is my desire to put the onus as these um, white folks did to a yes. woman that was uh, harassing a lesbian, black lesbian couple. The white people mm -hmm. stood up and forced this group of white people to leave the pool. Mm -hmm. This is not our fight. Our fight and our work is internal for me. It's in our community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you want to understand, there is a sister, a sister, but it's a white woman that has an Instagram account called mm -hmm. No More uh, White Saviors. Oh, sorry, No White Saviors. 
She has a million followers. She's in Uganda right now with COVID. She's feeding our kids in Uganda and got COVID in the hospitals from Philly and has been there, not new. She's been there for three or four years doing the work. It's not my responsibility to worry about white folks understanding us or even embracing this conversation or embracing black owned. I need to make sure that every black child, every generation Z, generation A, they know about John Graham's book, that they, the little girls know they can go to Liz Liva's website and find out black women do mean business and how much black women bring to this earth. That they know they can go to Daryl and watch a hip hop video explain about insurance. That they can follow Ray and they can follow the other uh, influences on black owned and understand what's coming and what they can, whose shoulders they can stand on to do their idea in AI or do a, their idea in virtual reality based on the fact that Ray did what he did based on his father's work. So I don't, I'm contrary. I don't really believe that it's our responsibility to bring white folks along. It's their responsibility one to be present and then being present means being an abolitionist. It doesn't mean being an ally. We don't need no more allies, but that's just me. I got to drop it, y'all. I got to drop it. That was look good. Here. That was good juice. Look here. You you see what you're doing with my mic, right? Hey. I, I would drop it straight on the floor. But instead, what we use to navigate our mouse, I'm going to drop that on the floor because that's a mouse drop. That's a mic drop. That's a everything drop, what you just said. So y'all want to join me? Y'all got a mouse around? Come, come on, let's drop this <laughs> mic. We'll touch touch I got a pin right now. All I'm right. Drop the pin on you real quick. That's oh, on, 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 on three. Y'all ready? One, two, three. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. There you go, Wait, I wanna, I'll circle that back in real quick with a great comment question Vern, uh, Vernon Hamilton had. He said, do they want the truth or do they want the comfortable lie? Do they want the truth or do they want the comfortable lie? That's now this is where action happens because much of what Martin's point is, it's not my responsibility to teach you and make you work on this conversation. So all of our white allies, abolitionists, looky lures in the audience, thank you for at least wanting to learn, at least wanting to be a part of the conversation. But in general, do they want the truth or the comfortable lie? I think they typically don't want the truth. And that's a part of the problem is that they have to, I, I, I'm a little bit between Donna and Martin in that I do believe that in order for us to really make progress, when we're talking about government, when we're talking about healthcare, when we're talking about business, when we're talking about higher education, any institution, we're not in the majority. So the people that are in the majority, if we look at the Juneteenth law, if we're thinking about all these strides that we want to make, uh, we have to become self-sufficient and have our own systems or we're basically asking the power structures that be to create movement in the right direction in terms of civil rights. And those power structures are dominated by what white folk because white folk are in the majority. So I think we almost have to, I think, put the onus on them. When I look at my Black, um, Black History and Culture Academy, looking at just anecdotally and just kind of looking at who, who a lot of the people are that have joined the platform and, and who are educating themselves. A lot of them are white folks that have followed me on LinkedIn and have taken the initiative to actually become more aware of 50 classes on black history. And they're taking those self-development classes, professional development classes. And that's what we asked them to do. I was in a talk earlier and somebody was talking about appropriation and um, how sometimes white folk don't know what to do or what to say. And I look at my husband who's white and people always think I'm married to Black Panther or maybe something like that because I'm so outspoken. They're like, your husband's white? Yeah, but guess what? He's a barber. He's worked in black barbershops his whole life. And you know what he does every night? He looks at YouTube videos of cutting black hair because he knows in order to stay up on game about the styles, the enhancements, whatever black man want, he got to study. He got to make sure that he's on top, on tip top on his A game. And that's what you they have to do. They have to really put the work in. I'm gonna make in it order for now. them to understand our community and our struggle, I really do think that in order to be a part of it, they have to really put that onus on themselves to be educated about it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Couldn't agree more, Liz. And, and yes. look, at the end of the day, we are, we are the only uh, community or culture in the world that has that we have to unite mindset. Let's say that again: Black Americans 
are the only culture that take that viewpoint that we need everybody else to be uh, successful. If you think about this, uh, historically, in the first civil rights movements, or the first civil rights legislation in 1866 in the Reconstruction era, there was specific legislation that was supposed to repair the newly freed Black folks, right? What they did was they slipped in a word that then became the catch-all, right? And that word was minority. And so it, it broadened the, 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 the perspective and included more people. And so what ended up happening is now immigrants could, could claim benefits. Uh, uh, and then you had gender benefits, right? And then you had women uh, getting, getting rights. And, uh, then you had, uh, you know, this, these words that became catch-alls that diluted the benefit that was supposed to be specific to repair black folks who were newly free to the point of, of, of being insignificant. And these words like minority, like BIPOC, like POC, like all of these catch-all feel-good phrases that broaden this, this umbrella mm -hmm. to capture everybody but, right? There's a reason why they don't center black. There's a reason. You have to, you have to be very aware of what's not being said and everything that's being said. And so as we think about this to the point of uh, Dr. Claude Anderson and Poweronomics or, uh, or his entire series and thinking about if we are in a construct that is built on competition it is a race, and we're the only team that doesn't have a team mindset. We don't play as a team. We don't operate as a team. We don't even wear right. We don't. We don't have a. We don't have a common turf. We don't have a, a playing field, as it were. We don't have a, a, a banner or or unified colors, agenda, team strategy. None of that. So so before we start trying to bring the world in, <laughs> to right, we need to first and foremost understand. You know what is our what is our number one or uniquely common identifier that will unify us as a team first and foremost? And we didn't create the construct. Remember that that was created, you know, in the 1600s when they made up race, right? But now that this is the construct we're in, every other dominant culture, whether it be uh, you know uh, European, uh, Asian, uh, uh, you know, uh, Jewish. Uh, any any other community that has a common code, team mindset, us first, we'll transact with everybody else, you know, and 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 integrate and work, but it's us first. Yeah. They have they have a leg to stand on, right? They have economic power, they have political power, they have their own education system, media control. These are things that we haven't even tapped into yet. We have examples of success in these places. We don't have a communal benefit in these in these, in these places. So yeah, uh, to Martin's point, I'm the contrarian with that one as well. Well, so John, well. I'm bring Ray on that. Go ahead, Ray. Good information. I, I want to I that. That a little bit more because it was by design. You know, uh, when you look at black folks, you wanted to break up the family unit. You wanted to to uh, uh, dismantle the, the the household. You wanted to just break down the the male uh, in the house. You wanted to humiliate them. Um, you know, that was all by design. And when you look back on it and says, OK, when you try to make it just all about minority and not just about black people, there was a strategic um, a situation that said, here, we need to break them down for them to be able to not want to run away as slaves or not want to try to build their own thing. So how has that uh, expanded and affected our community over the years? Now, because you brought up a great point talking about it's not just minority, but it was conscious. And you look at it when you talk about it in the 13 minutes. Uh, you know, when uh, Avery DuVernay's uh, documentary, it was a different wordplay now than it was back then, but it's the same same concept. I love that. And I, I'm going to put some two comments up real quick. My uh, my queen jumping in the audience, she said, that's it. They need to understand. But more so, we must understand to stand together and lift each other up. And Yolanda here has a great comment, probably controversial. White supremacy is a team sport. Think about that's that. That's a t-shirt, Yolanda. Yolanda, let's work on that t-shirt. Let's get that out by <laughs> tomorrow. We're going to have it up on Zazzle. We're going to have a t-shirt. I'm hitting your inbox, Yolanda. Let's do this. Martin's going to DM you. But when you yeah, think about that. I, on Black Home, by the way. Yeah, BlackOne.com is selling too. But, but yeah. think about that. I mean, we, we don't want to make this a negative thing altogether. But at the end of the day, we got to do something with this. I mean, hearing all these things of the team sport. Quentin often says that we've been on the losing team. We want to get a win for once. So part of this collective of people, you've seen a bunch of black businesses up here, a bunch of black professionals on Donna's Facebook, on YouTube, on LinkedIn. Yes. Connect and call people, talk to them. I, I've mm -hmm. had a 
issue with first beginning working in insurance is some people say, oh, black businesses don't work as well. They won't pay the, the, the bill. They won't do this. There's kind of this mindset. We don't even try. We just say, nope, I'm not doing that. I want the stable Caucasian business. That's really good. We have a 400 year delay in our start to this race. Exactly. So yes, our businesses will be slower sometimes, but we've had not, we were, in, we were building somebody else's wealth for, four, I mean, for a long time. So think about that as you watch this, is that connect with somebody. I mean, Dr. Lotus does some great work internationally. You're working yes. across the pond, as they say. So talk about the yes. mindset of the U.S. taking action with this versus overseas taking action. Okay, so I wanted to share this before we even go to that, because I hear people say consistently that people of color don't work well together. Well, I want to dispel the myth because that's a lie. We do work well together, provided that we all come together in the oneness mindset. So I think uh, look for the shirt, black people. We work well together. Something like that. Yeah, I'm coming out with that. <laughs> Why? Because I teach people that it's really about your cognitive processing. We have to dispel the myths that we have been conditioned to believe, whether it's in our home or whether it's in our school. The educational system across the planet is broke in, in regard to how they identify people of color. Therefore, we must create our own message. We must create our own, like I say, record on the record player and we must put our own needle on the record player and play the music of life that we want to experience. And the only way we can do it is here because when we change what we think about, what we think about changes. Now that takes me right into doing business. Many times we have been told that we can only do business right here in the United States. But of course the pandemic has ushered many of us who weren't doing business globally. It has ushered us into a whole new way of being. And what I mean is this, is that no longer do the seas or the walls that people have put up the physical walls make us separate. And again, it's really all about thinking. It's really all about what we were taught to believe because we, we were compartmentalizing our business. But the pandemic, although it took a lot of lives, it took a lot of businesses, it also created a lot of lives. It also created a lot of business. And I must say that, yes, my brother, yes, I have. Oh. It. It has taken yeah. us to a different theory. We have to remove our mindset from the plantation theory and understand that cognitively we cannot be on the plantation because after all, what the heck? The whole plantation, the whole world is our oyster. But we just have to embrace the fact that we can do business wherever we want, with whomever we want, and almost how we want. And I say almost because... I don't believe in doing business unethically. So for those that do business unethically, that was for you. Stop doing business unethically <laughs> and stop doing business with people that don't do business with you. Here's the thing. If people are not doing business with you devoid of who you are, what your color is, what your sexuality is, what your relationship to the Lord is, you know, rethink it because I truly believe to whom much is given, much is required. And if you cannot get people to do business with you because of different things like that, you are required to go where the people who are going to support you are. And oftentimes it's overseas. Oftentimes it's not your friends and your family because a lot of times when we get in business and come on, y'all know this, when you first get into business, you calling everybody up. Auntie Tandra, how you doing? Yeah, I just started my t shirt. Yeah, I, yeah, mm -hmm. my t shirt business. I just started it. Could you buy 50, 11,000 t shirts from me? You could only buy two. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Auntie Donna, um, you know, it's low, low. What you mean? I, I know it's been three months since I called you, but could you buy a t shirt? And now I'm going to call Auntie Tandra back. Auntie Tandra, I just started a lemonade stand. Can you? <laughs> So what happens is the people that love us the most, the people that we love the most, we saturate them with our business ideas. Not that it's a bad thing, but oftentimes we have to understand they will contribute to us. They will support us, but we've got to go to a global mindset, reach mm -hmm. out beyond the ocean, reach out beyond the walls, because guess what? There is a person who needs your message, your message, your product, your service is the, is the solution to somebody's problem. And that's why I tell people, think global. 
if you think global, then guess what? I got a I got a pack of tissues around here. Let me let me have that pack of tissue. Somebody give me some pack of tissue. If I can't find a pack of tissue, let me let me show. Give me give me the pens. Give me the yeah, give me the pens. This is a this is an interactive. This is an interactive thing. Look here, look here. You see all these pens? Here's the thing. When you think just in the box, because all of us have probably at some time been told you got to think outside of the box. Well, here's the box, and when you think outside of it, you fall right here. And then if you think outside the box and you get really lucky, you might fall right here. But I challenge you as global change makers, you've got to think outside of the stratosphere and see, yeah, I'm on the road. I'm in a hotel right now. You see my setup. I got to pick these pins up later on. But guess what? I'm keeping. Outside of the stratosphere, <laughs> you can throw yourself, you can throw your product to, to, to Quebec. You can throw your product to Afghanistan. You can throw your product. That almost hit me, y'all. You can throw it to you can throw it to Africa. And guess what? Somebody's going to catch on. And yep. you're going to ignite and take flight in the business area of your life as well as the rest of your life. So that's why you must move the social media needle in your life in your business and go global because once you go global like they say once you go black you never go back once you go global listen to me so, so well, thank you because once thank you go you. black you never go back here's the product <laughs> hello you're speaking my language miss lady you know me i'm all things network yeah you are speaking my language yeah i have to say you're right, Daryl. There are so many amazing and phenomenal people with businesses on here. Please, let's connect. Please, let's connect. Connect with each one. You know what? We ought to just throw out, you know, a challenge and say, listen, can you connect with at least five people on this on this link? There you at go, least, five people. At least, at least connect with five people. Because just like Lotus said, you go global, listen, you ain't going bad. But listen, it gives us so many opportunities. When I said this, what this means to us is creating opportunities, y'all. This... This is creating opportunity, some amazing yes. opportunity. Look, you talking my language now, sister. So you know me and you right here. You I knew right. there was a reason Lotus <laughs> came on when she came on. She, she's the second half. I'm going to come in and shake it up real quick, everybody. But I'm, I'm that vein of action. I mean, throwing the pen, that's not an action. I don't know what else is an action. But part of this, I mean, everybody here, I want to have a challenge. Everybody leaves to close this out with a, a challenge. We already had Sandra throw up, connect with five people because... Juneteenth is an acknowledgement of the end of slavery. That let's just keep it real. It's not like we're being paid for it. There's no reparations. There's no money, like John said. So, what's the challenge? Like, I know, for example, my family's going to go to some events, but we're going to talk about Juneteenth and the history. I know I didn't get that. I appreciate my father jumping in here in the live. He basically was thanking everything I'm doing, and I appreciate my father for saying that. But we didn't talk about that. We talked about that when I was younger, and then that's not anything wrong on him. Just the tools weren't there. Now the tools are here. So that's something we're going to do is talk about it and visit some events that have historical elements to it, not just a party. Somebody that's going to teach something about Juneteenth. And you guys know I always thought the black businesses, so I got that part down. Exactly. But Quentin, what's the challenge or action you want to tell everybody here watching this, whether live or on replay, what's the challenge you want to give them to do with this day and actually to make it make an impact? Um, the first thing I would say is, is that be intentional with your dollars on that specific day on Juneteenth. Um, you know, we've always been looking for a way to recycle dollars and, you know, um, the blackouts. But I think this is a time for us to black in. And, you know, we one of the things we need to do is build some stamina in doing business with other blacks. And, you know, if we can start with a specific day, Juneteenth, let that day be the day that we say we're going to be intentional about how we spend our money. I think that's a great place to start. And then if you're not consuming on Juneteenth to pour into somebody else, whether that be, um, you know, helping them with some of the challenges they may have, whether that's a uh, house note, rent, car note, you know, you can get 10 of your friends together and help somebody out that way. Or you can get uh, a couple of people that are just beefing and figure out how to bridge the gap so that we can honor our ancestors and the challenges that they faced, the tremendous amount of fortitude it took for them to go from being enslaved to building a black Wall Street, 
you know, the, uh, the blueprint is already there for us. We just need to embrace it and everybody be all in together to build together. So that, that would be my simple challenge is, is to be intentional with how you're going to spend money on June 10th, Juneteenth. Awesome. All right, Donna Dean, the most phenomenal president of the company I've got the pleasure of meeting. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, back back to uh, the queen of all queens, Lotus, triple mic drop. She said we got to have a global mindset. And I want to leave you with this. I think we also have to have a spiritual mindset. I think we also have to acknowledge that there is a creator who created all of us. And I'm here at the helm alongside of my great leader, Quentin Anderson, as the president of BlackOwned.com, because just like on an airplane, you got to put the oxygen mask on yourself so you can survive, then put it on your kids so they can survive. Well, guess what? Mama Coco, otherwise known as Donna Dean, my black kids, my black community are my kids. And so I'm at the helm to bring my people up, bring my community up. But I'm doing it out of the lens of my creator, God himself, who, who, who I'm called, uh, whoever is whoever's there to listen, to help ignite this movement, I'm called to speak to you. See, we're all called to do something different. Some of us are the head, some the eyes, some the uh, shoulders, the feet, the legs, but we all got a part to play. We don't all have to have the same part to play on the stage. Just as long as we come together, the music's going to play and we're going to march forward and we're going to transform this world in unity together. So I want to leave you with this. Join forces with BlackOwned.com. We're here to ignite a movement, and we're here to help the Black community and our people within this community rise in the areas of education, employment, economics, and entertainment. And we're looking for brilliant builders to help us to do it. So uh, with that being said, I'm going to pass the baton over to the next brilliant person on this panel. Thank you for that, Donna. All right, Ray, I'll pass it on to you, King. What's your call to action for people to do with Juneteenth? Well, first, I want to acknowledge all the great speakers and uh, Daryl for you being the, the, the moderator and putting everything together and to all the uh, you know, people that uh, joined to be a part and to listen. Um, but my call to action is to show someone that they're bigger than their block. You know, um, when I when I was young, I, I, I thought it was just you know, Palmer Park, Maryland and Allendale Drive. That was the whole world. But when you, I got to see that here, there, there's more to the world than just my block. It changed my thought process and perspective. So I challenge everybody to show someone whether you're in Oakland, whether you're in, uh, uh, in New York, in the Bronx, whether you're in Atlanta or whatever, show show somebody that they are bigger than just their block or just their surroundings and that they can expand, uh, you know, on, on what the sister, uh, the doctor said about being global. There's a, a such much bigger world out there than just where we are. So, um, you know, take care of you, take care of yourself, but show somebody that there's a bigger world than that we can uh, do something in besides just our block. I like that. That's a T-shirt, too. I'm more than my block. Martin, let us know what you're going on, King. What's the call to action? Definitely watch these three movies. Uh, one on HBO Max is called Exterminate All the Brutes. Watch that first. Next one on Amazon Prime is Enslaved. Watch that second. And third, Century of Self. So you could binge watch you know, a whole bunch of things, but I would encourage for this weekend and definitely also again for Kwanzaa, to get together as a family and binge watch those three documentaries, maybe one per day, because uh, they are four hour documentaries. But be ready for that conversation that the next generation is gonna wanna have with you about like, uh, mom and dad, is it time we consider moving from the United States? <laughs> because you're gonna see um, here, the doctrine of killing black and brown people integrated into the society. But largely, you're going to also see that doctrine, how it is implemented globally. So theory of mm -hmm. moving to the United States doesn't mean you're going to actually run from that doctrine. It's all around the globe. So the next question, mom and dad, is going to be, what are we going to do about it? And so having websites like blackowned.com, having websites like blackfacts.com, having sites like, still around, blackplanet.com. <laughs> we can leave Facebook, y'all. We can leave LinkedIn, y'all. We can leave YouTube. We have black sites to go to. So while we may not find a country, we can definitely find a virtual country. I'm Martin Dunn speaking. Virtual, the clubhouse thing. Virtual Wakanda. That's why I was saying the other day, gentrification is the new colonization. Basically the new fancy, nice version of doing it. But Liz, what's your call to action for people for Juneteenth? 
Yeah, I feel much the same as Martin, that this year of being really out outspoken and advocating for social justice, and keep in mind, I don't just talk about police brutality or about quote unquote controversial. I, I, I uplift black women. I talk about black women business owners. I talk about women that are handling business. I think about how we can amplify those that have been super successful and it doesn't mean that we don't have struggle in our community, but there are a lot of us that are doing big things. And every day I think about not posting on LinkedIn and I've done it every day for probably almost a year. But I've been called an N word, I've been called a B word. When I had my op-ed piece that went viral in um, on CNN's website, I had maybe a hundred or so emails on my work email calling me everything but a child of God. So we have to think about supporting those of us that are still being outspoken. Ashanti Martin, who wrote the article, Black LinkedIn is Thriving, talked about how a lot of us that are being very vocal on social media and have been outspoken over the past year do feel reprisal, do feel um, the trauma from constantly being called these names and, and being attacked. Um, Aisha Joseph was also featured in that article and she talked about the idea that you know she can't even get a job now because she is under scrutiny for a lot of the outspoken nature of her posts over the past year. And a lot of us feel the same way. So I think about creating safe spaces like this where we can talk and speak our truth and supporting each other and uplifting each other, especially those of us that are being not only business minded, but those of us that are very outspoken about social justice and have the backlash that comes against us because of the fact that we're doing that. I love that you said that. We just we should be able to say these things and not have it be a problem. So please support Aisha and what she has going on and make sure that we just make community out of this because that's where I made this platform a professional black because I felt like there wasn't a place for us to talk about our experiences on LinkedIn without making it negative and just kind of saying this is what we deal with, just take it how you take it. Um, Lotus, I know you're going to bring a whole pile of fire and pens and books and whatever else you got to throw in there. What's the call to action you want to give us for Juneteenth? The first call to action is ignite and take flight in every area of your life. And you may say, Dr. Lotus, how do I do that? Well, here are a couple quick tips on how you can do that. First, love. Lead with love in everything you do. But you have to start with loving yourself. Love the skin that you're in because the skin that you're in will always win. But it starts with the love that you are in from the inside out. The second thing I want to share with you is please share this share this broadcast. This is the call to action. Share this broadcast with everyone you know when you get up in the middle of the night to go uh get a bite to eat or you go tinkle. Share this broadcast. Start what they used to call a watch party. Start a watch party and share it and listen to the broadcast over and over again so that it might inspire, empower, and enlighten you to step to the next level in your personal life, in your spiritual life, in your business life, and even in your physical life. And then the other thing I want to share with you, full price, full price. Put that on your t-shirt. Instead of going to the store in your community where it's a black owned store and you say, let me get a discount, pay full price, pay what they're asking you to pay. Show love in that way. And here's a new word for you. Instead of hateration, cohesivation. Yes, I made that word up. Let's be cohesive <laughs> as people of color. And that's my call to action. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And my call to action for doctor is to please spell that word and tag me in <laughs> I got you. so that I can post that word and make yeah. it part of the urban dictionary. Yeah, and you know I had to write it down before I said it. it. Urban dictionary. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I, I have to say, Liz, I need you in my life. I already have Dr. Lotus in my life. I'm just I'm 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 crossing the bridge. I yes. need you in my life. Yes. Dr. Lotus, you already in my life. You're my sister. It's a done deal. Yes. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm feeling all nice and full. I know it's supposed to rain here in Georgia, so we know what kind of Juneteenth is going to happen here. But at least we have the internal things we can do on the computer to learn, to educate ourselves, and talk to a business. We even have Matt threw it out there. Matt spelled it on the light LinkedIn live. Cohesivation. He, he, he made it already, Martin. He beat you to it. He already has it in the live chat. <laughs> and then we also had Rosalind say, join the BFF club. And last thing, to end this out, why can't there be a social media platform like LinkedIn for businesses that are Black-centric to propel Black businesses to rise? I'm going to leave that for Clinton. Well, um, that was a great question. 
And I'm going to let Donna answer it because uh, I see she's coming <laughs> at the pit. So uh, great question, our leader. My fearless leader. <laughs> Uh, so to answer that question, absolutely. We have built what's called blacktalentcommunity.com and it launches today on the eve of Juneteenth. It is not a jo job board. Again, it is a, uh, it is a career and learning, uh, transformative learning space. Uh, you can create your profile, uh, www.blacktalentcommunity.com. Uh, join the movement, become part of this community. We're going to peer coach. We're going to do a lot of what we're doing today and learn from one another, grow from one another. And I love what Dr. Lotus said, love, self-love. There's going to be inspiration uh, moments, learning moments uh, on that platform. You can video chat with one another, but it's an opportunity for us to uh, really create that sense of community that we can call our own Wakanda style. How's that fearless mm. leader? <laughs> that's a way to end it well thank you everybody for tuning into this on live and replay i appreciate even just giving me the chance to be in this space and to be around these amazing minds um for wells fargo there are black professionals out there they're all right here you see they're in the live chat they're in the replay they're in linkedin youtube facebook we're here so please folks make sure you go to blackhome.com sign up for the email list and blacktalentcommunity.com to be a part of the conversation there'll be more to come but if anything, Google something about Juneteenth. Just take a minute to do that. Just look up general order number three. If you want a good place to understand what to do with it going forward, just start there. General order number three is a great way to understand how the nation actually reflected on slavery when they told people they were free. Um, I love all you. I appreciate all you giving me the space to do this. Please Darryl, be safe, folks. Up, pardon me. Go for it. Everybody in the audience, everybody on this virtual stage, I just want to take a moment to literally give none other than the bow tie superhero himself a standing virtual uh uh uh, uh because he, he what worked can we tirelessly say? on this i just have to lift you up and yeah you did thank amazing you for job all that you do and and uh putting this together with such a spirit of brilliance we appreciate everything that you do for this world and for our community daryl thank you so much for all you've done well, thank you for saying that. I, I, this is purely a labor of love with blackhome.com. There's there's no, Quentin's not paying me to do this. There's no back deal going on. It's just, hey, I like what you're doing. I want to help support it. So I appreciate it. All of you guys, please support each other. Connect with everybody in the audience on screen. People that hit like, whatever you see on this live or even in the engagement from the event page, a thousand people register. There'll be a lot of replays over the weekend. Engage those people, connect with them, talk to them. That's the thing I think that we lost from civil rights. We lost the community piece. Once we got civil rights done, we kind of said, all right, I'm on to myself. So right now, this is the nation is acknowledging something that all black people have to deal with. We all have to recognize what is Juneteenth? What is that? If you didn't know, now you have to know because on every major news outlet, so Google it and actually talk to somebody in your community, whether it's to buy a t-shirt, like the shirt, the shirts that Martin's going to sell on blackhone.com with Lotus, or if it's a insurance policy, if it's a quote for entertainment help, whatever it is, just talk to them to figure out what's going on. You'll be pleasantly surprised. And I, I thank you for uh, Kristen, one of our allies here in the audience. She actually applauded me. Thank you, Kristen. She's been a great supporter. Please follow her. Everybody in there, just go follow them, connect. We will catch you guys next Jordan, time. G -G. If the bow tie guy, if a, a, a follower gave no, me that, so said, I, I can't take credit. Now you know, so I appreciate that. <laughs> But I, I, if, if the energy is still there, we were supposed to do uh, Professionally Black about black men's mental health next week, Wednesday at noon. I got to get my brain right for a minute. I need some mental health break from helping birth this baby with you all for the last couple of weeks. So it might be a Professionally Black next Wednesday at noon about black health, mental health for black men. Please check it out. But all the comments are flooding in. I'm going to get out of here with y'all so you can go back to your families. Learn about Juneteenth. Do something. Don't just get red velvet cake and strawberry soda. Go do something, please. I know that's fun, but go do something. I appreciate all of y'all. We will catch you next time we get together. Let's give the Wakanda to close this out. <laughs> all day. <laughs>